So what about some tips? What about some tips, to, some things that you can do this weekend to help you on your journey to preparedness? I think this would be good for beginners in particular. Uh, these things don't have to consume a lot of your time, um, but you do want to block some time out maybe this upcoming weekend so that you'll have a time to do this in. That, that's one thing I see a lot of people kind of have problems with. They struggle with trying to find time. But if you schedule it ahead of time, let's say like right now it's the middle of the week, go ahead and schedule three to four hours on Saturday, two to three hours on Sunday, something like that, that you set aside some time to work on your level of preparedness. And so it's not that difficult. And you can take breaks in between doing things. You can do whatever you want, but just have some time scheduled. And don't just make it like, oh, I'll, I'll give myself 30 minutes to do all this. No, give yourself some reasonable time, at least a couple of hours, right? And so I have some ideas here, uh, especially for the new people that you can kind of get into it, you know, get into to the nitty gritty and, um, and start to make some real differences in your level of preparedness. So let me get my list out here. And the first thing I have written down is to map out at least two evacuation routes. And the way I would do this is just get a street map of your area. A street map that allows you to um, exit your town or city. So you want the map to be substantial enough that you can actually uh, take a highlighter and, and start from your home and highlight the streets until you're out of the city. So that's one thing I would do, um, first off. And after you have your first route figured out, then you want to probably do at least one more route and maybe the opposite direction if possible. And that's because you don't really know what direction a threat is coming. If there's a threat coming from the west, well, you probably want to move to the east, right? And so these are kind of things that, you know, are kind of common sense, but then you also want to Consider, though, when you are out of the town or city that you live in, where are you going to go? <laughs> where are you going to go? So, I mean, is there a motel, hotel in the area? Um, is there a campground that you could go and spend the night? Uh, is there a friend's house? Is there someone in the family that, that lives in that area? Things like that. And you want to just problem solve. Most of the time, there's a solution right there in front of you. It's just figuring it out. So that's one thing you can do. And that doesn't really have to take a lot of time. I mean, the most difficult thing maybe is if you don't have the map to go and get the map and then to use a highlighter to uh, figure out the route. Um, but if you've lived somewhere long enough, you probably know a few routes in different directions from your house and you probably know where they go. Um, and it's just good to do this. Because sometimes in the moment when you're really stressed out, you're not thinking very clear. And so if there's a threat, once again, coming from the West, you can just grab this real quick and go, okay, what's my options? And you're like, okay, I need to go East. And there's my East route and you just go. Okay. Let's talk about the next uh, project or uh, next idea for this uh, coming up weekend. And that is to check your supplies. Some people have no supplies, which is very concerning. But is that really true, though? Most people have at least something in their house. And uh, so I think that most people have something. It's just that it may not be purposely purchased for preparedness. And that's not always a problem. It's just know what you have. You know, do like an inventory. You know, make a checklist of things that are going to be helpful in, in an emergency that you have in your home. And with some of this stuff, you may even want to kind of put it together into like a, a box. And then you can kind of see what you're lacking, right? You can kind of take everything, put it together in a tote or some kind of box and say, okay, I got this, but what else do I need, right? And I mean, this includes extra food, water, uh, flashlights, extra batteries, you know, an emergency weather radio, all this stuff, right? I mean, do you have any of this? Do you have some of it? You know, how much more do you need? Things like that. And you'll get a good idea. 
Now, maybe you're on a really tight budget and you only have like $20 that week to spend on anything. Maybe that's all the, all the extra money you have. Well, at least you'll know how much you have and you'll know pretty much what you're lacking. So you can just, you know, very specifically know where to put that $20. Like if you have no, you know, food, extra food in the pantry. Um, I do know people like this. They pretty much eat out every meal. And if you just don't have almost any food at all, uh, that's a big problem, right? I mean, like, you really do want to focus on that. So it could just be something as simple as the next time you go out to get groceries, you just buy as much as you can afford extra. Um, or if you want to be really proactive this weekend, even if you haven't planned on going out to get groceries, maybe you just go out and get some stuff, get some food. Um, it's just an option. Let's move on. The next is to practice using your communication devices. And so basically, if you have radios, which you really should, some type of two-way radios, and if, especially if you have a family, and, and you know, in case for some reason, and these things kind of happen unexpectedly, but sometimes you just get kind of split up. And, you know, it might just be like you and your daughter um, and your partner and your and your like your son or whatever. And, and you guys split up for some reason, maybe out of necessity or something for some reason. And uh, to have radios, it's really good. Uh, but you, you want to be efficient. You don't want to be long winded and you don't want to be like just talking on there for a long time period just to convey something very simple. So you really want to practice. You want to practice with your radios. Like how could you tell someone efficiently and quickly that everything's okay or everything's not okay or meet me here? I mean, there are, you can use codes, but sometimes codes are really difficult to remember when you're under a lot of stress. So maybe on the back of the radio or attached to the radio in some way, maybe there's a, a little cheat sheet or a reference card to certain codes of what they mean. Uh, that can give you privacy in case someone else is listening in, um, especially for locations. You may not want to say over the air if someone can listen in on you where you're going because they might be there, too. They might meet you there and cause problems, but you might want to have a code set up, uh, some kind of like code word for a certain location and also a code word in case that you're in danger. And, you know, you can tell someone, hey, I'm, you know, I'm this or that, you know, you give the code word and your location in code. And that means that you need help immediately or something like that. And so um, it's going to be a really good thing to practice using your radios um, efficiently and also just to get them out and just to make sure they work well, to know the limitations of your radios. There's some radios that are very short distance and, um, some radios do a lot better than others in certain environments. For example, because of the frequencies, some radios are better to uh, to transmit out in dense cities where there's like tall buildings, where there's other frequencies that don't really do so well with that. And uh, this is just kind of how it is. So if you live in the countryside, you might have a lot better reception over distance because you have a lot less buildings and so forth, unless you have a lot of hills or if you're down in a valley or if you, there's mountain ranges in your area, then that could be a problem. Uh, but uh, it just depends on your environment, too. So it's good to know the limitations of your gear. Let's move on. Next, I have here that it's good to connect with your neighbors. Now, with all that's going on with the coronavirus, I totally understand why a lot of neighbors don't want to talk to you right now. <laughs> They're not just being like... You know, these stubborn people that don't want to socialize, right? I mean, they're just not wanting to get sick. And so, like, I haven't really been very close to my neighbors either for the last year, uh, almost almost a year now, because of all the coronavirus. Now, I do have one neighbor that thinks all this is just completely ridiculous, which, I mean, I do too. But they are almost in complete denial that, that there's even anything going on. Um, there really is something going on, uh, but they're not taking any precautions at all. Like I'm somewhere in between personally, like I take some precautions, but I'm not like freaking out. And I, 
if it wasn't mandated in my area, I probably wouldn't even wear a mask because I don't see the the evidence that it's really effective. But uh, that's another, you know, whole going down the rabbit hole thing. Uh, the situation, though, from my area is that, you know, you got about half the people that are really concerned and the other half are kind of like whatever. And uh, and it's one of those things that if you cannot meet up with the person, you know, like your neighbors, and I'm just talking about maybe like one or two neighbors this weekend, try to just connect with them. Even if it's just like, hey, I just just haven't talked to you for a while. I hope you're doing well. I just want to say hello. And that's it. I mean, it could be something super simple. Uh, what you could do is try to catch them when they're walking down to the mailbox. I mean, maybe in your situation, maybe the mailbox is uh, attached to the house and there's really no way to catch them that quick. Uh, but like where I live, my mailbox is at the end of the driveway, you know, right off the street. And, and I mean, it's it's a bit of a walk. Like my driveway is probably, I don't know, maybe 350 feet. It's not horrible or anything. It's just, it's a nice driveway, you know, to walk. And so whenever I look over, um, sometimes I'll see my neighbor walk down his driveway, which is a little bit shorter than mine. This is probably about 300 feet, you know, from the road. And, um, and so what I'll do is I'll jump out of the house real quick and try to catch up with them and say, Hey, how's it going? You know, and just, even if it's just a few words, you know, just so that they know that I'm friendly and that I'm not a threat and that, you know, I'm just a nice guy, <laughs> you know, and a lot of times they're not wanting to be very social. Sometimes they are, you know, it just depends, you know, on who it is and the time of the day, if they're stressed out or, or whatever. And so, um, but I don't try to do it very often. I don't try to jump out and try to catch up with them every day. That would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, they would get probably annoyed by that, but maybe like, like once a week or every other week, I try to connect with, on some level, even if it's just me waving at them or saying hello from a distance or something, something. And so the other alternative is if you have their phone numbers, which is good to have your, your immediate neighbor's phone numbers, especially for an emergency, but uh, to call them. If you have their numbers, call them and just say, hey, oh, this is so-and-so that lives right next to you, of course. I just want to say hello, just seeing how you're doing, you know, and uh, and you can just keep it real chatty for a moment or you can just, you know, just keep it real simple. And, you know, it doesn't have to last, but maybe a minute or two, you, you know, we're not talking about having a deep conversation unless they want to and unless you want to. Um, but it's just one of those things. It's nice to connect with your neighbors. And lastly, on my list here, I have to do something active, uh, some type of, you know, movement. And it could be some kind of simple yard work. Um, like right now, it's cold out. So I understand if a lot of people don't want to get outside and they don't want to get sick. Uh, but if you bundle up enough, you're not going to probably get sick. Uh, but for some people, they have a lot of leaves in, your, in their yard. Um, it's good to kind of get that kind of, you know, worked on. If that concerns you or uh, to at least go on for a walk or something. I mean, we're not talking about like going for a marathon here. We're just talking like maybe a 20 minute walk, you know, and if you don't feel comfortable walking on your sidewalks or, you know, on the side of the street or something in your area, because there's a lot of subdivisions that have little to almost no traffic, especially at certain times of the day or night. And, you know, so it's not really dangerous at all in some locations to walk on the street or on the side of the street. Um, and so, you know what I'm talking about. In some areas, it's very dangerous, though, to walk on the street. So you just you, you should know, of course, if it's dangerous or not. If there's like a bunch of cars running by, driving by at 50, 60 miles per hour, then, yeah, don't go on the street. Uh, but if you only see one car an hour on your street <laughs> and they're and they're driving like five, 10 miles per hour, I think it's probably OK <laughs> to walk on the side of the street. Just don't walk out in the middle of the street, you know, as if you own the street. You don't want to act like you're a vehicle yourself. Um, so with that, I'm just trying to say to be active, you know, get the blood pumping a little bit, get a little bit of cardiovascular something going on and get the family involved. Go for a family walk. Um, if, if it's not really an option to go like on the sidewalk or maybe you don't have a sidewalk in your area or the roads are really not really, you know, ideal for obvious reasons. And if you have any type of land at all, even if it's a small backyard, you could do like, um, you know, like just different things in the backyard. We could just be, you know, tossing a ball or running around in circles or something or doing jumping jacks or 
I mean, there's all kinds of things. Uh, jump rope is really good for you. Um, there's just all kinds of things. You can do push-ups. You can do crunches. Uh, if you have weights, you know, any type of uh, workout machines, use that. Uh, I mean, you know, goodness. Uh, I mean, there are some people who just live in an apartment and they have really no ideal situation. They don't want to be outside because it's too cold. Uh, maybe it's just not the nicest neighborhood. You know, if, even if it does have a sidewalk, you don't want to go and use it because people might want to rob you. I don't know. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people and people live in very different situations. But you might just live in an apartment or maybe a little house that has no land. Maybe for you, it's just that if you have, let's say, like a, a stair stepper machine or maybe like a treadmill or whatever you have, you just use what you have. I mean, worst case scenario, check this out. This is a number of years ago. I mean, it's been quite a few years, actually. It's been maybe nine and a half, ten years ago, roughly. Um, I found myself a bit overweight. Yeah, yeah, I was like really not in the best shape. So um, I was like, I'm, I'm so fed up with this. I'm so fed up. I, I, I hit my breaking point. I was like, I'm just ticked off. And, um, and so what I did, because I didn't have any kind of workout, you know, machinery or any kind of anything. Um, but I, I did have a neighborhood that was relatively safe. Thank goodness. And they, and they had sidewalks, really nice sidewalks. So I started to jog, walk and then jog and then do more jogging and more walking, not just once a day, but like all through the day, whenever I had a moment, man, I'd just be like, I mean, even when I got home from work, I mean, I might've worked a 12 hour shift and then just said, Hey, I'm going for a jog. And I did this for three months, for three months, I did this and I did like jogging in place in the living room. I would just jog for like an hour or two. Like, seriously, I, I, I really did this. And I also just watched my diet and gave myself um, between a three to 400, you know, uh, calorie deficit. I was trying to be careful, though. I was eating a lot of nutritious food, so I don't think I was, you know, deficient in anything. But I basically did that. And I did some, uh, I did get some like, uh, well, makeshift weights. I never bought real weights, but there was some things that I used around the house that I would lift in repetition uh, to get, you know, some strength and more muscle tone. And in that three month time period, I lost around 45 pounds. I mean, real weight, not just like water weight. I mean, like real weight. And of course, I can't prove that so much. I just know what the scale says. But I kind of started my real measurements after like the initial first five pounds went off because they always talk about like the first five to 10 pounds for most people is just water weight. And so um, like I really reduced my sodium and everything. And I, I really felt like that first five pounds I couldn't count. So after the first five pounds, which I believe is mostly mostly water weight, um, I started to really, you know, count my uh, my pounds that I drop. And it was really rewarding, really rewarding. And uh, and it was it was a great thing that, you know, you can build on your success. Uh, there was a few weeks in there, though, that I pretty much almost didn't lose any weight, which was a little bit like, you know, kind of confusing to me at the time. But I think I now know what it is. It's my metabolism kind of rev down a little bit. And um, and so I figured out different ways how to rev my metabolism back up. And so it's all about having techniques that work. But I'm just saying this because doing things incrementally is, a, is an amazing process to get results. I, I keep thinking about, you know, like over the years, I've learned a lot about the power of um, compound interest. I mean, and you can do this for investments or anything, really. I mean, it's just compounding in general is really interesting, compounding. You definitely want to check this out. I mean, there's a lot of good videos on YouTube about this, but there's also a lot of blogs and even books written about the power of compounding. And it's so amazing how far you can stretch something, not just like money, for example, and how to grow money, but I'm talking about how you can grow yourself, how you can compound yourself, how you can build off of your foundation over time. And how you can do this almost exponentially. It's really amazing. And so this is what I'm talking about is, 
is to get into motion and to get into good habits because we're creatures of habits, right? I mean, we know this, at least most of us know this on some level. And once you really acknowledge it outwardly and consciously, and you say to yourself, okay, I am a really habitual person that I, I, I once I get into something and I kind of start doing things, I'll, I'll do it a lot of times unconsciously. I'll just kind of do these things or think this way. And I don't even purposely sometimes even try. It's almost like you're in like a autopilot mode. And so habits can destroy you or they can just make you amazingly successful. So that's the thing is to pay attention to all of your habits. It's going to be very difficult at first because you won't even think it's a habit. But then you, when you really get to the root of everything you do, um, a lot of these things are not conscious. So they're probably, you know, habits. And so look at them. And if they need a change, if they're not good for you, really, um, or if they're just kind of really neutral, then you can make them something that is very positive. And this is something that you can you can do today. You can do it right now, in fact. You don't have to wait until this weekend. You can just just think of one or two things and and pick one. And and just say to yourself, okay, so I have these thoughts, these negative thoughts sometimes, and they really don't really help me. I mean, I'm aware that these threats exist in the world. So if you're if you keep thinking about something over and over and over, if you worry about things that really are not worth worrying about, or that are just really out of your control, then that's not helpful. So instead of doing that worry, what else can you replace it with? Well, maybe it's, you know, instead of worrying, you use that that energy as motivation to do something in the real world to better your situation right then and there. Or you can use that time to connect with another person, right? Or you can think about and, and plan ahead the next day so that you're more efficient at what you're going to be doing. And so you can transfer a lot of this energy into something that's much, much more positive and much more effective to help you live a better life. It's all about the efficiency, and it's also about getting returns, you know, for your time and and effort and energy. So we all have resources. In particular, we all have pretty much the same day, right? I mean, we, we do. We all have like 24 hours a day, and we all have the same amount of minutes and seconds, you know. But look at how some people are able to use them a lot more effectively than others. Isn't it amazing? Some people say, oh, it's because they have certain education. Uh, that could be part of it, maybe. But, but a lot of it, it's mindset. It's habits. It's about what you do in that time. And you still have the same potential as anyone else. And so if you feel like that you're behind, behind you know, in the pack, and you're, you just can't feel like you catch up, then look at the reasons why you're behind. And there's no reason why you couldn't be at the front of the pack if you wanted to, because all you have to do is do what the people who are at the front of the pack do. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know? So this is the thing, you know, if you look at successful people and you want to be successful, you might want to pay attention to what those successful people do. It's really not rocket science. And what you'll find, and I'll just use this as an example, is that people who are, say, like financially secure, they're not going around and just impulse buying things. They typically are very savvy with their money. It's not that, that, that they don't buy anything for themselves, but they do it very strategically. So it, it's just like, well, just look at what they do. And if you want to be like them, then do what they do. It's just that simple. It's not like it has to be super complex. And if it's just with, you know, outside the realm of what you feel comfortable doing, or if you just don't want to do that, then find someone else, as an example, that, do, that does things that you would be willing to do. There's all kinds of different avenues to success. Thanks for checking the podcast out. Have a great day.